This is a Drumwise Meets, and today I'm here with Steve Bowman. Hi, Steve. Hey, how are you? My first question for you today, Steve, is what age did you get into drums? And when you first started playing, what bands or artists inspired you? Wow. Um, you know, I got into it very early. Um, I, I always say I fell in love with the first drum set I ever saw. Uh, and so I think I was probably like five years old. And, and I really didn't um, uh, understand drumming or drummers. Uh, in the music I was hearing in the world at that time until probably uh, like the late seventies. And, and so it just so happened, the first drum set I got when I was eight years old uh, was a Ludwig club date, this used Ludwig club date, uh, Blue Sparkle. My parents had a friend that had it and somehow we got it for like 125 bucks. And so that was what was all over the radio anyway, you know, <laughs> and so, wow. uh, so that was great. But it was really the 80s when I started noticing drummers and drumming. And, and so I would say, and actually it was kind of in the era of drum machines. So an interesting tweak in the evolution of my playing was that I grew up thinking that you had to be perfect. You know, the drumming I heard on the radio was perfect. And, uh, and even the drummers were, you know, Steve Gadd and, and all the guys that were doing the, the records back then, um, J.R. Robinson and, and all those guys. So anyway, uh, yeah, that was the start. I probably gave you more answer than you needed, but uh, there you are. <laughs> That's perfect. And actually, you've answered my second question as well, which is normally what was your first drum set? But I'm going to, you've told me that, but I'm going to ask, have you, do you happen to still have it? No. No, uh, you know, I was so young. I got that drum set. I played it for years. And then I got like added another bass drum, added two toms and this and that. And then I painted all of it to match. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just going to say, I was thinking, because a club date these days, you know, they're worth quite, quite oh. a lot of money. <laughs> Maybe not if you painted it. <laughs> yes. In fact, I, I'm looking at one right, right to my right. I, uh, I later found uh, the same sizes and the same basic drum set and picked it up. It's not the Blue Sparkle, yeah. but I love it. It's a 20 with a 12 and 14. You know, those yeah. are, you have to have a little kit like that to throw in your truck and, and go, you know, play quickly or, yeah. or softer or just beautiful tones in the studio it's just you know wonderful so and that's actually my next question what uh, what is your current uh, equipment setup so what do you like to use these days well i do i love um i i have a couple ludwig kits i have you know that little club date and then i uh, a set i use more often is uh 24 13 16 um I also have a relationship with San Francisco Drum Company, which is a company out of uh, San Francisco, and they make drums. <laughs> uh, and they uh, uh, make these gorgeous, like, pieces of art. And I have one of those, too, at the house. Uh, I actually was on tour with Luce in 2006 and had my San Francisco drum set, drum set stolen. <laughs> Uh, the van and trailer were stolen on the road and we never got, I never got it back. But uh, Gary the Williams, the owner of the company, was kind enough to loan me one. So, uh, so I'm scared to take it out of the house. But, but I, that is a 26 inch bass drum. These gorgeous, I mean, they're, they're such beautiful uh, kind of modern vintage drums. You know, it looks like something you'd see like in the 30s or 40s. But anyway, so. I have lots of drums sitting around and, and I'm just looking around. I always have too many drums, but I tend to stick with Ludwig SF Drumco. Mm. And 
if I still had all the Yamaha drums I've owned and sold over my lifetime, I'd still, I'd play those a lot because I love Yamaha too. It also happens that all my favorite drummers played Ludwig, you know, and, and so it's like, well, oh, shit. Uh, what's not to love <laughs> exactly and um, we talked off camera about my current gig uh purple zeppelin so it's the the deep purple led zeppelin tribute and ludwig is obviously perfect for that uh oh. you know i, I use uh, i know that ian pace only used ludwig for a very short time but i uh i use a, a clear vista light um yeah. for that with uh drum lights in it so that oh, in the yeah. first half it can be you know it can just be see-through and it just looks like a normal drum kit and in the second half put the lights on it's orange, so it, you know, uh, amber vista light right there. <laughs> you set it up left-handed for the deep purple. <laughs> or, uh... <laughs> My next question, um, disclaimer with this one, I would find this one really hard to answer. So good luck, Steve. Um, I believe uh, that we all evolve as drummers and we take on different influences as we grow, you know, in age and in obviously what we know and the, the music we take on. That said, if you had to pick just one, who would be your all-time favorite drummer? Well, I have to start by saying, I, I always used to say, I love all the Steves. <laughs> Steve Jordan, Steve Gadd, Steve Smith. Um, but I think uh, what I always come back to, and I've, you know, you do, you do styles based on the music and, and the artists and everything. But I always come back to Steve Gadd. That is like a warm bath to me, hearing his, uh, the, uh, the ghost notes, the, it's the, uh, the soft notes that draw me in, you know. Um, uh, just such a, uh, uh, his, his playing conveys a soothing kind of ease to me. It just makes me feel like I could go do anything on the drums. And I, you know, you can't, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the Phil from Chucky's in Love, for oh. example, you can't, but <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's, that's one of those films that I will pull out to, to students and show them. And I'll be like, listen to this. And, and I'll say, I'll say before they hear it, this is one of my favorite drum films of all time. And they'll be like, oh, okay, I must, I must listen to this then. And then you just see their jaw just drop. And yeah. it's, oh, it's just, oh, it's just magical, isn't it? Yeah. Of course, then they'll say, well, how do you do it? You say, well, let's, not, <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. No, and that the other one I do for students is uh, play that uh, Dear Prudence, the, the third verse of Dear Prudence. And it's so funny because I used to always tell people, the reason you need to love Ringo is because of Dear Prudence. And it turns out it's Paul playing drums on it, I think. So, <laughs> but... But that drumming, that kind of sexy, right on the beat behind it, uh, swinging sometimes, ah, just gorgeous. It is excellent. Now, possibly another difficult question here. What's been the highlight of your career so far? Mm. Well, you know, there's, there's been so many great times. Uh, obviously, Counting Crows was the biggest um, level I ever toured on and played on. I mean, you know, we opened for the Stones and did Saturday Night Live and all these. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, it's tough not to go right to that one. But I'll tell you one that, that uh, a highlight of of my career was out in England with, with uh, where you are. Um, there's a wonderful producer named Sean Janaki. And he uh, brought me out to do a record with this amazing band called Ico, um, I-K-O, English band. And, and they, um, we did this uh, record at, um, in Wales at that studio where they did all these uh, at Rockfield. Mm. And so, the piano that they recorded Bohemian Rhapsody is sitting there. It's like, and I was there for like a week or 10 days living uh, in this, you know, like it was so British. I just loved it. And I got, I was drinking tea and, and uh, I would walk into the little town of Monmouth and, and, uh, and I, 
you know, it's one of those things. There've been a few of those in my career where, you know, I've looked around and thought, oh my God, I'm in France and, and this is amazing, you know, or I'm in England, I'm, you know, in Utah on a mountain uh, and we're going to go snowboarding. <laughs> so there have been so many um, wonderful opportunities. You know, in music, if, if you can get to a point where you're touring, um, I mean, I, I've, I've seen the world um, you know, based on, on playing drums and, 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 and I just feel so lucky, man. I've, I've been paid to travel around the world. It's, it's incredible. I think that's, that's a really good highlight right there. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you, you mentioned uh, Counts and Crows there, and I think this is a good time for me to, uh, to sort of just ask you about a, a, a specific Counts and Crows album and uh, tell you a little bit about what that album means to me. Um, without boring everybody too much. Um, so first of all, um, Steve obviously played on August and Everything After. And first of all, Steve, what an incredible piece of drumming on that album. I mean, that is just, your drumming is just beautiful on that. It really is. Um, and yeah, that album for me played a really pivotal part in, in my career. And in fact, my life, to be honest. So um, at the time I was probably about 15, and I was doing motorsport and, and you know, like karting. Um, I don't know what you call it in the US, but on a, on a national level, little like go-karts. Um, and um, I was also playing drums, but my, uh, my, my dad said to me, right, look, your drums are starting to, you know, get in the way a little bit of, cause you do, you're doing gigs at the weekends. We, we, we're meant to be racing. You need to choose one of these two things. And I was like, ah. Oh man, this is really hard. But then one of my karting friends knew I was into music and he gave me two albums, two completely different albums. And I'll always remember this. He gave me um, Dookie by Green Day, um, yeah. <laughs> which, which is a whole different you know, thing, but that, that's got Great. a special place in my, in my heart. And the other one was August and Everything After. And you know, those two albums made me go, I don't want to be a, a Formula One driver. I want to be a drummer, and uh, and I chose drums. And if I hadn't made that decision, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now and have the career I have now and have the wife I have now because I've met her through you know through drums. So um, yeah, it's played a big part of my life. But getting to my point, um, you know, when you recorded that album, talk to us about um, you know how how you guys recorded it and how you come up with your parts because um, you know you mentioned. Um, you know, like Ringo or Paul's musical drumming earlier. Yeah. Um, you know, your drumming is so musical on there and there's just gorgeous little things. So yeah, talk to me about uh, how you sort of came up with what you came up with. Well, there's, I guess there's a few facets to that, but the main thing is that when you have a singer like Adam, who is so dynamic, you know, if you can follow Adam's dynamics and key into the mood of the song, the feel of the song. I always say every song has a mood, you know, um, the song is about something and that something normally has a feeling. So if you can uh, attach to the feeling, then it kind of plays itself. Um, <clears throat> and so part of uh, that was, uh, was loving the songs and being, you know, uh, moved emotionally while playing a song and, and that kind of came out um, and that's part of it but one of the big things I think about that record was that you know T-Bone Burnett produced it and uh, and I was pretty young I came in with more notes than were needed <laughs> you know and uh, and so he quickly uh, cut that in half uh, and so on a few things like there's a couple songs where I originally played it with 16th notes, but now was playing it with 18th or with eighth notes, but I was still thinking 16th notes while playing eighth notes. And so on a song like round here, for example, That's um, literally what I had in my head just then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause that was one where I was and it, it became with me just, putting my left hand on the hi-hat really lightly and going, you know, uh, 
but but the feel and the fills were were still thinking 16th note so little things like that that another thing while we're there is on on the song uh omaha remember omaha i do yeah yeah well on that one uh t-bone said hey we're gonna try this one without symbols just before we recorded i was like what because i already had my part yeah and uh and so i ran into the kitchen because i needed something i put that i put this little 18 inch bass drum i had over by the hi-hat and i thought it was going to sound like a 808 mm, yeah. you know but it just kind of went mm. <laughs> and that's the sound there but then i took this I took the handle off the frying pan, washed the eggs out of it, and set that on, a, on my tom because I wanted something for a ride symbol because in my, I already had my parts and now I had nothing but toms and a snare drum. So, so what ended up happening was you hear that goofy drum that didn't sound like an 808. And then you hear this frying pan on the choruses if you listen closely. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I tried to maintain my part, but it totally changed. And the lesson was T-Bone took someone who already had his parts. I know what I'm doing. And instead of recreating those, I was now creating. I was totally in the moment, listening to this song and thinking about concentrating. I had a mallet in one hand and a brush in the other, I think. And, and so that was T-Bone kind of broke me down in a good way on every song. And, and what happens is, you know, he did that with everybody. And then pretty soon uh, you work with a few producers and instead of them doing that, you come in with that. And you're like, oh, well, I, I remember the playback sounded so great when I, when I did that, I'm gonna do that again, you know? And next thing you know, it's like, hey, this guy's good in the studio, you know? <laughs> so, because you've stolen all the tricks that you've picked up. I mean, talk about evolution of a drummer. Yeah. Uh, there's kind of no other way to do it than that, unless you're, you know, a genius. <laughs> so. And did you did you prepare with like you know different splashes and stuff? Because I know there's quite a lot of um, ni nice little parts in the song. You know, hats to splash stuff. That yeah and. Again, uh, that I had to be very judicious with because as soon as I uh, hit the splash the first time, uh, T-Bone said, what is this, Tower of Power? <laughs> and in fact, I had been studying with David Garibaldi at that point, and I was so into the linear stuff. Um, it wasn't great for that. But, um, but yeah, uh, I was, well... I think I, in in relation to today, I was kind of a drummer nerd. I was kind of a wanker. Um, and when we went out live, I had chinas on both sides, just like Terry Bozio. And, uh, you know, I could have gone out with a four piece like Stan Lynch or Ringo, but, uh, you know, <laughs> that's what I do now. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, especially if I'm if I'm loading my own stuff. I'll be fine with a four piece. Mm. I'd crash, I had so. <laughs> well. Awesome. And uh, another question, uh, which I have about that album, which I only found out recently, because um, people uh, only the other day on, on one of the Facebook forums were commenting on your, your playing on that album and saying about how amazing yeah. it was. And then uh, someone said, oh yeah, I love his playing on Rain King. And then someone else said, oh no, that's, that's someone else. And I was like, what, hang on. And I did a bit of research. Was like, oh, it appears that it was. So, what's what's that all about on that song? Um, no, it's uh, uh, not right. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. That's yeah. sorry. Yes. Yes. Right. Well, this is part of the. Uh, uh, you know, I was young and just I wasn't ready. Uh, I wasn't uh, mature enough to uh, uh, handle certain situations, and one of the ones was that. I didn't like the song and I didn't play it well. And, and we were gonna bring in a percussionist to do some stuff because again, 
I didn't feel like I really knew how to do that very well. And I just wanted to be a drummer. And like, instead of picking stuff up and learning it, I was just like, we'll have somebody else do that. Well, so we brought in Denny Fongheiser, yeah. who is an incredible drummer. And uh, he had played on all these hit songs. And, and he, he was like one of my favorite studio drummers at the time. I knew who he was and I was excited to meet him. So we brought him in to do percussion and play on Mr. Jones. They asked me to recut Mr. Jones. And I, I, I just, I should have been more of a team player. But at the time I just thought, I mean, I remember telling him, I don't know what I'd do differently, you know? And I now know, cause he came in and played it with an eighth note feel. And I was playing it with a quarter note feel. Okay. And uh, it made a big difference. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, Denny played on Mr. Jones, the big hit song. Mm. And, uh, so what, when we toured, um, it was, uh, always fun to play because, you know, I didn't do it on the record, but that's all right. Because when we played it, like, I can't, it starts with don't, it's a kind of thing where when you start that song, uh, you know, 150 feet go in the air it's just pandemonium so it was always fun to play and i liked it after that just because <laughs> you know. but yeah that was what happened oh, and um, yeah. it's uh, i just thought, I thought it was worth asking and actually that's that's a really good your answer there's i think it's a really good lesson for for some people you know um just you know in, in that situation it, it's, it's great yeah definitely because i think you know with um the benefit of hindsight and and so on you know and when when as when you get older and when you learn more stuff i've had that before i look back at a situation and think oh why did, why didn't i try this or that you know yeah <laughs> and now if you want to get deeper into it i know now that i was afraid i couldn't do it mm. i didn't know what they wanted and and I knew that whenever we played that song, I was just kind of like, ah, let's get to the next one, <laughs> you know, but, but I didn't. So if I'd been more confident, I might've been able to say, you know, let's listen to some other music and see if there's something that's, you know, I don't know, we could have honed in on what was going on because it was a pretty easy fix. Mm. Um, but, you know, Denny's so good. Uh, he, he, uh, he was great on that song and in hindsight, maybe it needed Denny to push the the song over the edge and and for us to have success. I don't know. Right. Well, moving on from from you know that album specifically and back to just general drumming. So, um, when you first get a gig with a new artist, how do you go about learning the songs? Because obviously, I know you teach as well. So this is like me putting my teacher hat on here and kind of you know going, coming coming from from that point of view. Um, you know, do you just listen to the material? Do you listen and transcribe? Um, or you know, has anyone ever sort of given you the entire like folder or book of music and gone, here you go, here's here's the whole thing for you to read the dots? Yes. Well, you know, in Nashville, it happens a lot. Um, but in fact, there's so many times it's a joke. You you learn 12 songs to play one show, you know, <laughs> you learn a full set to do a record release party. Mm. And that's it, because, you know, the artist can't afford to pay five band members and, you know, whatever. Mm. So it happens a lot, but it also depends on the gig. Um, if it's I'll tell you, one of them was that I once had the great luxury to sub for a week with uh, Toad the Wet Sprocket. Now, you may not know that it's a, it's a band that had some beautiful songs, uh, hit songs here in, in the States in the 90s. And, and the thing about their music was that the bass drum and the bass all matched generally. And so if you were to not match the bass drum pattern, it'd be a problem. <laughs> and so for that, I, I ended up subbing for them for a week or two because their drummer uh, had a family problem, family emergency. And, and for that gig, I remember freaking out about those bass drum parts. And so I made charts that I could read for every song. And like for the first few nights, I had the charts on there, up on stage. 
because I want to make sure it's dun, 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 or dun, dun, dun. Um, and so for that, that's what I did. And um, and then there was another time, actually, I have a blog about this on my site. Um, I got a call from Train and Train's drummer's wife was going to have a baby and they needed somebody to be there in case that, you know, he had to leave. And he had rented a car, was driving behind the tour bus. And he's, as soon as he got the call, he was gone. <laughs> and so um, for that one, um, I was a little uh, worried because there were so many, uh, there were a lot of uh, tracks, click track and lighting cues and all this stuff. And there was a drum solo in the middle of it. Uh, <laughs> a drum solo going back and forth with the singer who's a great drummer. I was like, oh my God. So uh, for that one, I remember just immersing myself in it. I had it on in the car and then I got home and put it on. And then I went to my shed in the back of the house and listened some more. And I immersed myself into it uh, into the, to the point, I tried to get to a point where um, I felt the music. I Like any song you grew up with, you know, you know it, you, your arms just jerk to the rhythms of it. And so I tried to get to that point. What happened was I went out with them and the, the baby didn't come till after the tour. And so I never got, you know, the opportunity, which yeah. might've been for the better, <laughs> but, but so for that one, I remember just, I, the reason I put a blog about it is because I saved all my notes. And so I have kind of where I started, what I got down to, and then what I took on stage, which was who started the song mm -hmm. and the tempos, I think were a lot of them were set. You pressed a button and something started because there's lighting and video and all this. Um, and so it got down to who starts the song. And if there was anything I kept forgetting, I made a note of that, you know, like don't play on the bridge, you know, uh, so, but but yeah, it kind of depends on the situation, how much time you have. Mm -hmm. But what I would always rather do is listen to it so much that I know it, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so. And uh, from that to my next question, um, have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from that you can tell us about? Oh, so many, I mean. I'm embarrassed to say all the ridiculous things that have happened. Uh, but I'll tell you one that happened early because it was uh, it was one of my earliest gigs ever working with electronics, which I must admit, I'm still not comfortable with. You know, some people are great with that, but um, I'm lucky we got on line together today. <laughs> so, but... I had what was called an, a Roland Octopad. Do you okay. remember those? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I had it plugged. It was above my hi-hat. And I had all these really cool sounds in it with this band I was playing with. And I also had this little microphone that was going around so I could sing background vocals, right? And, uh, and so this, the set started the very first song I have these, I'm hitting these big things, these like thunder claps and all on the octopad. And I hit it really hard and the jack popped out of the back. And it was, and now it was, had no power. And I turned around and said, something about the effing octopad is unplugged with this microphone in my mouth that shut. <laughs> and so, ah, it was like, <laughs> Everybody was pretty clear on what happened with the octopad after that. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, so yeah, there have been things like that. I remember another time I, uh, I missed, uh, it's just silly. I was out with this artist I really loved. She had all these amazing songs. I was playing this big show with her and I just looked one past on the set list and went to the song and it starts with drums. And that's how they knew that I was, just like looking around everybody's looking back smiling and i finally just kind of stopped playing and then looked down and went to the next song and we started like a ballad it was like okay <laughs> uh but yeah that was another super obvious drummer muff uh, so anyway i could probably go on and, and tell uh, 
people would rather be stock car racers than drummers. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, no, those are great. Awesome. And um, now on to my curveball questions for you, Steve. So my, my first one of those is, what are your hobbies away from drums? Hmm. I'm glad you asked because um, I'm 54 now and my hobbies have become much more important to me than they used to be. Um, I think it's kind of natural as a, as a drummer to be super focused on that. I mean, I, I, I lived and breathed drumming for so many years. I still love playing. I have a, a teaching studio here at the house and I do um, work here. I love uh, uh, communicating time, feel and note spacing to, to players. Um, but now my, my hobbies are, are just as important to me. And, and I have a few, one of them that's always been there is books. I'm a book nerd. I, I, I love uh, shopping for books and reading books. And, and um, I have a few authors that, that um, I, I really am into. So that's one, but I also have a cat. My cat Jean lives here uh, with me, and uh, she's uh, the love of my life. Uh, but I'll tell you, my big one. Oh, I want to say cycling. I love, I love bikes. I love riding bikes. I love cruiser bikes, road bikes, gravel bikes, uh, fold-up bikes. I love bikes. Pictures of bikes. <laughs> so, um, but my my current thing, which which I love, is disc golf. Disc. Have you heard of disc golf? No. no. My goodness. It's taken over in America. And I know that your country has some really good players too. Uh, but it's basically golf with fris little discs, frisbees. Okay. And um, we have some amazing courses out here in Tennessee. And I love throwing things. And, and I love... Uh, throwing for accuracy and and I've never had a real strong arm uh, I played I played baseball growing up I love baseball but I was the second baseman because I, I wasn't strong enough to throw from third base so um, if that makes sense I don't know if you guys care yeah. about baseball but uh, but but this is a thing where I can throw something 300 feet <laughs> I mean these discs get on the air and just keep going and it is mesmerizing and of course I throw 300 feet you know most people throw 500 feet or 400 feet you know but I love it it gets me out in nature I'm throwing things around I'm making baskets it feels good and and oh I, I say to anyone careful because you could get hooked on this I know everybody I speak to out there that's playing is just like I feel like I have to do this every day. It's like, yeah, I know what you mean. So I have, disc to, I have, golf. To, have, I have to have a look and see if we've got any here in the UK. But I know that something that we do have, um, I think it's called foot golf. So it's uh, football and I've, golf and you kick a big ball to get it in a hole or something. I've seen that. That's, I've only seen it like on, on YouTube. It's a European thing. There's a disc golf course where they actually have a combination you could play with a with a frisbee or a soccer ball or <laughs> you know or maybe even golf golf i don't know I, but yeah wow, wow. It's i would like that too i i fancy myself a pretty good kicker <laughs> not for accuracy i mean not for distance but for accuracy yeah. i like that i like you know like um I'll set things up in the backyard and, and throw at them or kick them, you know. So, so yeah, that's an interest outside drumming. So my second curveball question, what's your favorite cookie? Wow. That is a curveball. Um, I will state first, I'm an ice cream guy, but uh, sure. Um, I guess I like peanut butter cookies. Oh, that's a first, I think. I don't get we've had that yet. Is okay. it? Peanut butter cookies, nice. If you like ice cream, do you, uh, you must have the like Ben and Jerry's, is it called a switch or whatever, where it's like a, a cookie and then it's got the ice cream in the middle? Oh, yes, we have those. Uh, I don't know what they're called, but yeah, they have those. 
Oh. In case you just can't get enough of either. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's That's, a nice combo. <laughs> We used to have those, I can't remember what they called, but it was one of those things you'd eat one a year just to remind you that it's too much. And then about a year goes by and you're like, man, that looks good. <laughs> you know, I want to tell you a funny story because you mentioned your two records uh, uh, that you got early on, Dookie and August and everything after. You know, there were so many bands from the Bay Area, which is where I came up, Oakland, uh, uh, Bay Area, San Francisco, um, and Green Day was there too. Uh, you know, Green Day and uh, Primus and, uh, uh, well, I mean, you go back to the 60s and there's a whole uh, Huey Lewis in the news in the 80s, I mean, the Metallica, and it, there's always been all these bands. Uh, but, uh, but right after Counting Crows, it's about 95 or six, um, I used to go out, uh, uh, Trey Cool lived near me. And uh, I used to go down to this place and, uh, you know, get breakfast around two o'clock, you know, and, and he'd be in there sometimes. And, and so we'd end up hanging out and talking. And I, I always thought it was so interesting. Uh, we'd sit there and, you know, eat grilled cheese sandwiches and hang out and talk. And, and, and no one would ever look over and say, hey, is that the guy from Green Day? <laughs> or is that a guy from County Crest? <laughs> Uh, but it was always fun. We did it a few times. And, uh, and it was one of those things where there were so many players in that area that, uh, you know, there were times uh, uh, you just run into somebody at the coffee shop and have a conversation. And, and, uh, and uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a really fertile place to be back then. I mean, and bands were getting signed. I mean, I named a few bands. I could go on and name 20 bands that you remember that came from within 10 square miles of where I grew up, you know? So yeah. really interesting that way. What, what, what an amazing area for music. And obviously you now live in another amazing area for music, so. <laughs> yeah, Music City. Yeah, exactly. So my last question for you today, Steve, if you could give just one bit of advice to people starting out learning the drums, what would that be? Now, obviously, I know that you you teach as well. So, you know, the, giving one bit of advice is really hard because there's everyone's different. You know, you have several students and they all need different things. But um, if there was just one thing that, that, you know, you think is massively important, what, what would that be? Well, I'll tell you, uh, there are a lot of things, obviously, depending on the person, as you say. And when you're teaching, uh, you can never really come in with any ideas about what they need because it always changes and that's fine. Um, but one of the things I like, uh, there are a lot of things that everybody would say, but I'll tell you something that, that I like to say. I like to work with players that are a little older. What I love is um, a semi-pro, someone who's trying to get into a session where, the, uh, where they're doing sessions and touring because that's where I feel like I can really help uh, save some time and energy. And so my advice would be know who's hiring. If you know who's hiring for what you want to do, for what I want to do with sessions and touring, it's artists, producers, band leaders, right? And those are the people that are going to get you the work that you desire. And so it's important to know what they want. What do the people hiring, what are they looking for? And it turns out they're looking for stuff that's great for a drummer. They're looking for time, feel, and uh, uh, accentuating the mood of a song uh, as best you can from the drum position. And, you know, I grew up working on a lot of different things and a lot of tricky, uh, you know, um, and, and that's fine. It's fun. And, and you may end up in a style of music where you need that, you know, but I grew up on pop music and radio songs. And so for me, the best advice I could have had at 18, figure out the mood of a song, right? Because as we said, every song has a feeling. What is the feeling? And if you can feel that while you're playing, no matter one instrument, 
while you're getting your tones, while you're comprising a part, while you're playing it, um, if you have the feeling of the song, then you will become indispensable to the people that are hiring, the people that matter, <laughs> producers and uh, you know, music people, uh, artists and band directors. Um, so you can work on whatever you want, but if you can figure out how to convey emotion on your instrument, you will uh, never go hungry. So Steve, thank you so much for your time here at Drumwise today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And also just another little side note, a fanboy side note, Thank you for your playing on August and everything after. <laughs> My pleasure. I always say the record would have done just fine without me. You know, the songs are great and I'm grateful that I was there for that. But real pleasure to meet you. And I thank you for uh, giving me a tap. <laughs>